Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The season finale for Ahsoka is here and wow, a lot of things happened. I mean, all the major parties that we followed in the last eight episodes have completely split up and gone in their own direction. And in today's video, I really wanna just focus on what's going to happen to the people who are left on Peridium. I really find it interesting that all of the individuals who have been stuck on Peridia before are now on their way back to the known galaxy. This includes Thrawn, the Great Mothers, and Ezra. Meanwhile, all the individuals from the Star Wars galaxy, like Sabine, Ahsoka, Hu Yang, and Balin Skull, and Shin Hati are now stuck on Peridia. It's almost like a changing of the guards. First, let's talk about Shin. I kind of feel bad for her here. Yes, she's consumed with her lust for power in a very traditional dark side way, but she's a young woman, and not only has she sort of been abandoned by her master, she was also abandoned by Thrawn and the Empire that she had hoped to serve. In the short term, things seem very disastrous for her. Instead of being at her master Balin's side as he attempts to find an ancient power, or Grand Admiral Thrawn's side as he reestablishes the Empire, she's last seen walking up to a bandit camp, and I guess she wants to potentially take over as their leader? This might seem like a demotion at first for Shin Hati, like a step backwards, but we don't really know what exactly Balin, Skull, and Thrawn are going into. This could be a very high risk, high reward kind of situation. And you know, Shin Hati, again, she's young. She's inexperienced. She's yet to reach her potential. I mean, who's to say that Thrawn wouldn't just use her as a disposable asset to, as he did with Morgan Elsbeth? And again, we don't really know where exactly Balin Skull's going. We don't know what is going to happen to him. In my opinion, he's heading towards great disaster. And I think he's doing Shin a huge favor by separating from her. And so Shin Hati, in a way, is starting over at the very bottom again here, but this could be a crucial step for her. She should try to be optimistic. I mean, she's finally in a leadership position. She no longer has anyone looking over her shoulders or above her in the chain of command. Although I think there is an off chance that these bandits might not accept her as their leader, at least immediately. We aren't really sure what exactly makes up their culture. Do they worship power and strength? Are they aligned to the dark side? I mean, that's a lot of red armor. Could these individuals be Sith cultists? Or maybe just Peridia's version of Dothamiri Knight brothers? Someone in the comment section actually wrote that Shin Hati's appearance um, in this bandit camp reminds them of the first Jedi exiles that were sent to Korriban and like ran into the native Sith species who saw them as almost gods because of their ability to manipulate the Force. I think that's a really keen observation. I also feel like this ancient planet is rich in the Force somehow, and so it would make sense that you would have factions that know Force users intimately and are willing to worship them. I mean, the Great Mothers are here, right? Shin is definitely a really interesting character, and I would love to see her more in the next season. Before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Skillshare. If you guys are looking for some inspiration or maybe to learn some new skills for your journey in life, well, Skillshare is the premier online learning platform out there, and it has thousands of different classes for different skills that cover a really wide range of topics. From entrepreneurship or how to become a freelancer to more specific skills-oriented courses about 3D modeling and Blender, how to publish a book on Kickstarter, or understanding how artificial intelligence can aid you in your creative work. I personally really enjoyed and probably needed the Mastering Productivity course from productivity expert Thomas Frank. His neatly organized course introduced me to a bunch of different apps and methods to further streamline my workflow so I can get my content out quicker to you guys, and of course, dolphin free. Now, I'm a small operation, it's just me and my editor, Congo, and so keeping my workflow simple and clutter-free is important, and it helps me keep up to date with what's going on in the Star Wars galaxy. The first 500 people to use my link will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers, 30 days free and 40% off of your first year of Skillshare membership. Check out the description down below for more information, and thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. Then we have Sabine Wren and Ahsoka Tano, and uh, Sabine is faced with the same choice as basically earlier on in this season. Does she follow, does she pursue Ezra Bridger? And in this case, instead of handing over the fate of the galaxy to Balin Skull, Sabine has to choose between saving her master from Morgan Elsbeth and her stormtroopers or going back to the normal galaxy with Ezra. Sabine decides to choose her master, and I think this is actually the right choice. And after the battle, the two return to the nomadic village of the little crab turtle guys. I think this will be a great place for Ahsoka to finally finish Sabine's training. 
In the finale, it's revealed that Sabine Wren is in fact very force sensitive. And we see that when she double jumps Ezra onto that Star Destroyer. And so now it'll be important for Sabine to learn how to harness that power, have it on tap at all times and control herself. Now, at the same time, it should be noted, I think uh, Professor Hu Yang, Ahsoka and Sabine have the best chance of getting off of this planet still because they do have their Jedi shuttle. Its hyperdrive might be a little bit too slow to travel in between galaxies and maybe they don't have the navigational charts, but at least they can get off the planet. Little nomadic turtle guys also seem to be pretty handy with hydro spanners, so maybe they can help modify their ship in some way. But considering there's no real civilization on this planet other than these nomadic tribes, I'm gonna guess that they don't have the technical expertise to do anything drastic to the ship here. I mean, this whole planet is just a bit confusing to me, to be honest. Like, was there once a great civilization here? The Dothmeri Kingdom, did they build cities? And is what we're seeing now all that's left? I do get a sense that Ahsoka seems to be a lot more chilled out ever since uh, she turned into Ahsoka the White. She's kind of given up on worrying too much about things like Thrawn, and she's just given herself up to the Force, it seems. I guess Thrawn has always been Ezra Bridger's problem anyway, and will continue being his problem in the Star Wars galaxy. It's almost like Ahsoka understands that she'll have a greater purpose here on Peridia, and I think that has a lot to do with Balan's skull and her own past with the Celestials. Ezra is where he needs to be. And so are we. Now, I think Shin Hati will probably be an early antagonist for Ahsoka and Sabine to fight in the next season. It's gonna be those bandits versus the uh, villagers again. The last time Ahsoka met with Shin Hati, she defeated her quite easily. Whenever Ahsoka doesn't use a blade, it means she's facing a much weaker opponent. Surrender your weapon. I can help you. And I think Ahsoka senses that Shinati is just a young girl. She's inexperienced. Yes, she might be consumed with her pursuit of power, but I don't think she's a lost cause at all. And so I can see Shinati joining Ahsoka, although Sabine is probably still kind of pissed off about that whole home invasion and shanking incident. But if I'm correct about what lies in the wastelands of this planet, uh, Ahsoka Tano is going to need more than just one apprentice. She'll need as many apprentices, as many uh, people helping her as possible. Okay, so let's get to the most interesting storyline on Peridia, and that, of course, is the Tale of Balin Skull. He sort of wanders off in the last battle and leaves Shin Hati behind. It became really apparent that Shin and Balin were kind of drifting apart in the last few episodes, whereas Balin is focused on childhood stories and legends. Shin Hati is very much focused on the present. Stories of this galaxy are considered folk tales. Some ancient past, long forgotten. With good reason. Sometimes stories are just stories. <laughs> Jinati has been told what they would find on Peridia. Power, such as you've never dreamed. But I think Shin isn't on the same page with Balan in their definition of what power actually is. And isn't it our turn now? Won't our alliance with Thrawn finally bring us into power? You know, Balan's already seen empires rise and fall. He's seen the Republic, which lasted tens of thousands of years, collapse within a day. I mean, he also saw the same thing happen to the Jedi Order. So. He wants something a bit more permanent, a bit more powerful. That sort of power is fleeting. What I seek is the beginning. So I may finally bring this cycle to an end. Which brings us to this final shot here of Balin's skull standing on a giant monument of the Celestials. The father you can see clearly, the brother is at his side and the sister's head is gone. If you guys know what the daughter stood for, well, this is not a good sign. You see, this family uh, is known as the Celestials. These were Force gods, and they had so much power over the Force that, um, in a lot of ways, their own actions could bring in balance to the entire living and cosmic Force. The father was neutral, the brother was oriented to the dark side, and the sister was oriented to the light side. Now, all of these Celestials died during the Clone Wars when Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano visited their ethereal realm. The father was looking for a replacement to help him bring balance between all of his children, and Anakin, being the chosen one, was deemed powerful enough to fit that role. But 
Even the best laid plans oftentimes get waylaid when Anakin Skywalker is involved, especially. The son ends up trying to kill the father and inadvertently kills the daughter instead, and then the father then tries to kill the son and sacrifices himself as well in the process. I'm not really certain what death means for these individuals because they can clearly travel in between realms. They have powers that we've just never seen any mortal Jedi or Sith wield. Although all three of these individuals were killed by the Dagger of Mortis, which is supposed to be the key to their destruction. So who knows? Now, Ahsoka also died on that planet as well during this trip, but before the daughter passed, she actually transfers her essence into Ahsoka, bringing her back to life. And so Ahsoka, in a lot of ways, carries the daughter's spirit and powers inside of her. And I get this sense that ever since Ahsoka's trip to Mortis, uh, the Celestials have basically tried to keep her alive. It's almost as if she has some greater purpose, some destiny she needs to fulfill. The Celestials, as we mentioned before, have immense amount of power. They constructed the world between worlds, and Ezra Bridger actually uses this extra dimension to save Ahsoka from certain death when she's fighting Darth Vader. And Anakin Skywalker, at least his Force Ghost, saves Ahsoka using the world between worlds as well when she gets defeated by Balan Skull on Setos. Her inability to die is what really makes me believe that she does have this destiny. Just like Anakin is destined to be the Chosen One, I think Ahsoka is destined to fulfill the mission of the Celestials, which is kind of also balancing the Force. And actually to reinforce this idea in the finale for the first time, uh, Ahsoka actually sees Mirai very clearly. Mirai is a owl spirit guide for the daughter who ever since Mortis has followed and kept Ahsoka company. This is the clearest shot we've actually seen of this owl in live action, and I think it's a reminder of how important the daughter is in this story. Now, if you take a look at the scene with Balin, he's standing on what looks like the father's outstretched hand. I believe at one point it was pointing to something far off in the distance, and if you squint a bit, you can actually see a bright beacon in the mountains flashing. What it is, I don't really know, but in our previous videos, we have talked about a fourth member, a fourth lesser mentioned member of this family of Celestials. We, of course, were talking about the mother. The mother is not, you know, related by blood to the Celestials. She was actually just a normal human being who served the family, and she was able to bring balance between the son and the daughter somehow. She's said to have even been able to channel the son's destructive tendencies in creating structures in the side of cliff faces. Now, as the mother grew older, she became more afraid that she would lose her family that she loved so much. She wanted to become immortal like the family, and she understood the sun had used the font of power and nexus of dark side energy, which offered limitless powers to those who drank from it. And the daughter had bathed in the nexus known as the pool of knowledge, which gave an individual all of the knowledge from the past and future. Mortals were never supposed to consume that amount of power and she's driven mad immediately by her actions. And the celestials sort of abandon her in disgust. She would be left behind alone on this planet and she would end up corrupting the entire planet. But I'm starting to think that the world of Peridia might be an analog for that ancient planet. There's just way too many little hints that are pointing towards this reality. And the statue of the Celestials is just the latest, as is the presence of Ahsoka, the Owl Mirai, and the mysterious power that calls on Balin's skull. Something calls to me. Can't you hear it? Something stirs here. Can't you see it? You know, in Legends, Abeloff did the same thing. She would try to attract four sensitive individuals um, you know, near her lair, her planet, and then she would try to absorb them and consume them. And I believe this is Balin Skull's purpose in the story. He is Skull, one of the wolves of the apocalypse, and he will unleash Abeloff. This is also why Ahsoka and Sabine are not in a rush to go back to their own galaxy. I think both of them sense that their purpose is here. They need to stop Balin Skull and Abeloth. And this is an evil that might be even more terrifying than Emperor Palpatine. One of the cooler aspects of Abeloth is her ability to hop in between realms. Uh, she actually spends a lot of her time in what's known as the Beyond Shadows realm. You see, in Legends, the Celestials use large gravitational tractor beams to surround her planet with black holes to keep her in place. And so the only way she could reach out to people and make them her minions is by reaching out through the Force and talking to them that way. Ahsoka already seems to have access to these types of ethereal realms, like the World Between Worlds, which does share elements with the Beyond Shadows realm. In Legends, you actually had this group of people called Mindwalkers, and they spent all their time basically exploring this other realm. It should be noted that it's in Dave Filoni's nature to borrow from Legends and alter those stories to fit his own narrative. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, sometimes it's just kind of neutral. 
The presence of the Dothmiri, the fact that this planet is another galaxy, seems to indicate that there will be some differences if Abeloth does, in fact, return. It seems like whatever monstrous presence was on the world, it's brought the collapse of the Dothmiri kingdom. And, you know, uh, Ezra said Thrawn actually found the Great Mothers asleep on this planet. So maybe they were in hibernation over fear of something. And Balin Skull seems to believe that the presence of the Great Mothers reveals something about a hidden power he only heard in legends. I see what once was the great witch kingdom of the Dathmiri. The existence of the Great Mothers confirms this. They seem eager to leave this place. Maybe we should too. Perhaps they flee a power greater than their own. I'm really starting to lean towards this theory. I think there's a lot of validity here. And once again, Filoni knows the fans. I think he's tapped into uh, he taps into a lot of these forums and tries to see what's popular and what's not. And I think there's a really good chance if anyone's going to bring back a Legends creature like uh, Abeloth, it is going to be him. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. Now, as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.